Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on the third movement of Beethoven's Sonata Number no. 8 in C minor, Opus 13, the Grand Sonata Pathétique, and we have covered the first and second movements in previous tutorials. I actually think that first movement was one of the very first pro practice tutorials many years ago. Uh, so it's been fun to improve the equipment and uh, the production quality of these videos, but I hope all the information in these pro practice tutorials helps you become much more efficient in your practice sessions. Before we get started with today's tutorial, I'd like to just uh, start by playing just a bit of the piece, uh, the first 17 bars. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it or just need a little refresher. Okay. Um, just a little forewarning, I am recording this. This is dedicated for my good friend in China, Chen, who translates all of my pro practice tutorials into Chinese uh, for me. Um, he has been begging me for this for quite some time. So I've spent the last week getting this into my fingers. I've taught this many times over the last 10 or 15 years, but I've never actually learned it. So I've worked on this for about a week, and I think it's in decent enough shape that I could at least convey the ideas that I would want to uh, go over and which I have gone over in all of those lessons. Let's start off first with the form of the piece. This is marked rondo, and it does follow A, B, A, C, A, B, A, and then a coda. So you may even label that coda D. Um, however, it's a sonata rondo form because this rondo replicates much of sonata form. What I mean by that is we have this, the A sections that keep coming back are very traditional uh, with what we see in a rondo. So we see that in bar one. We see it come back in bar uh, 61 and 62. Okay, right after the B section, and then we see a little C section here, which is new material. Um, and then we see the A come back in bar 120. Okay, and then we see a final return of it right before the coda in bar 171. Okay, and so I, I did quite a bit of research <laughs> exactly where these sections come. Um, because I always double check my analysis with other people's analysis uh, because I've had theory teachers fight about the form uh, with each other. I've seen them do that. Um, and some people will label this uh, 171 as the beginning of the coda. And they'll say, you know, this is just one big coda. Others mark it at 182. That one makes a little bit more sense to me because you have the return of A and then you have this little transition. Let's see. Okay, and then the coda starts. Um, but realize that analysis is a bit of an interpretive uh, thing. It's not always absolute. So don't get too caught up with arguing about which bar the coda starts in. Realize that we are in rondo form, but now let's go over why it's sonata rondo form. The reason is as the B section, the large B section starts, which is right after this uh, cadence in bar 17, we see this. But this is transitional material. And then this is our second subject here. Okay, and you might be thinking, okay, Josh, why, why is that sonata rondo form, though? Well, if you look at it, it's treated very much. We have the transition, then we have the B section. In a traditional sonata, we have the exposition, the development, and then the recap. And the recap has generally two themes, sometimes three themes. Um, but the second theme comes back in the home key. Okay, so we were in what key? So we're in C minor to start out the A section. And the second theme is in E flat major, the relative major, okay? What key are we in when it comes back uh, later in the piece? This is bar 133 uh, into 134. Again, we have this little tra uh, transition st starting the second B section in 128. So that's transitional material. Oh, we're in C major. 
So we're in the home key of C, and that's very traditional in uh, sonata style. Uh, a lot of people call it sonata form. I had a teacher at Michigan who was a Beethoven expert. He's like, it's better to call it sonata style because this was a style people were writing in. But it, again, it wasn't an absolute form that everyone strictly adhered to. They would change things. And we're seeing in this Beethoven, he took a rondo form, but implemented sonata elements into it. So keep that form in mind as we go through this. And I'll just mention those sections as we go through as well, uh, just to remind you of which bar the new sections come in. Okay, so with that, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, just real quick, this was written in 1798 when he was 27 years old and published in uh, 1799. So this was a little bit before his, um, right before he's going deaf, um, Beethoven lived an extremely tragic life. Um, a few interesting correlations before we get started with this. That's the uh, Bach Partita number two in C minor. Also, if we look back to the first movement, um, this is bar 237, we see a little correlation. And they've also, uh, scholars have discussed how this also has correlations back to the Mozart fantasy in C minor. So we have a few different elements of influence, perhaps, in this third movement. So I just thought I'd mention those. The first thing that I want to talk about is touch um, as we dig into the technique of this. And I'll go over fingering. I'll be going over uh, phrasing, uh, expression, how we can differ repeated material pedal markings. I generally like a little bit drier of an interpretation. Feel free to completely disregard that advice. Uh, one of my favorite pianists, Beethoven pianist Richard Good, he does quite a bit of pedal. I tend to like a little bit more dry, but it's, it's completely up to you. That is interpretational. Just keep in mind with our huge modern pianos, uh, that have a lot more resonance. I've played a Beethoven era piano. It's not nearly as powerful as this. So if you are going to use pedal, be cautious to not overdo it and make it too blurry because we are playing on more powerful instruments than was available during Beethoven's time. Okay, so with touch. I want you to combine two elements of staccato. I want you to grab each key very slightly. You don't need these long swiping motions, but, but you are taking each key. That was something that Sergei Babayan always said. He said, take the keys. And I like that because it adds a deliberate element of attack. Um, and attack isn't always the best word, but it's, it's a deliberate taking of the key. And I like that. But then we soften that. We make it a little bit more buoyant and we write an insurance policy on our staccatos by using a little bit of wrist as well. And whenever I say wrist, I'm not locking off the wrist, um, locking off the arm and just using wrist. I'm actually using a whole the whole mechanism a little bit. But it's not like I'm bouncing up and down like a really heavy arm staccato like you might use in Tchaikovsky uh, Concerto Number 1. I just want that really buoyant sound. Now, already... We're in bar one. I want you to be thinking about interpretation. So go to there and then let's. Okay. One thing I want you to try on these grace notes, if they're giving you trouble, I've had a lot of students either do this and totally flub it, or they go, you know, I guess not a lot of students, but but they'll, they'll do them really slowly. You can do what I call crushing the grace notes. So playing them together and then releasing the, the grace note. Okay, so, um, so it actually sounds like a really fast grace note. Like that. And it gives that really crisp sound. And then after you've practiced that, if you... If you want to go back and separate it, it's very easy. If you start with separation, I notice that students tend to do that. Also, practice it without the grace note. 
that really helps. A lot of students get screwed up by those grace notes because they feel like they've got to squeeze in like an extra beat or something. You don't. Those grace notes are just a decoration. Think of a Christmas tree. You could hang, you could have a bunch of ornaments, but without the tree, <laughs> you're not decorating anything. You're not ornamenting anything. So same thing in music. This is your principal line. Okay, so then when you put it in, you can crush them. Also, what crushing does, and that's just my made-up term. That's not a, a musical term. Um, what it does is it, as you immediately release that, notes that are held generally sound louder in our ears, so it will automatically voice it for you. So it's right. If I didn't, if I didn't release that grace note and I did this, then I'll definitely hear that top note. But because I'm letting go of it so quickly it voices that principal line beautifully and just ornaments it with this light little grace note.